here at Boulder Bookstore signing books again. I've got a huge couple of baskets. Wander cell phone, if you want to show. <laughs> so uh, hopefully we won't run out as fast this time. But uh, if you go to the Boulder Bookstore website, which I'll put a link to below, uh, just enter in the comments that you want a signed copy and uh, they will send you one anywhere in the world probably. So thanks and be from Colorado. All the best. So we have Professor Henrik Williams here from the University of Uppsala. Uh, as I was mentioning before, he came on screen. Uh, Professor Williams is probably one of the world's leading, leading living renologists. And as I learned uh, two or three years ago at SAS in Minneapolis, you also did the runes for the Minnesota Viking Stadium. That I did. Yeah, so that's a claim to fame. Mm -hmm. My claim to fame. So tell us a little bit about uh, this recent article on the Rook runestone. Well, the, the Rook runestone itself, of course, the greatest mystery in runology we've had for about 150 years. And there have been any number of attempts to propose some kind of interpretation of it. And various uh, proposals have been put forth. Um, in 2007, no, I should back up a little bit. Uh, the, the general understanding from 1958 was that there was a verse on the stone dealing with Theodoric the Great, the mm -hmm. Gothic king who ruled in Ravenna the, in the 6th century. But this was questioned in 2007 by a Gothenburg professor, Bugralf, uh, who by reading a dip, just a single rune differently, he, instead of uh, Theodoric ruled, he gets rode on the horse, did the champion. And this set off the interpretation in a completely new direction. I have to say that I listened to him in Oslo proposing this, and I thought it sounded like pure BS, to be honest. Okay. Um, but nine years later, another Gothenburg professor, Per Holmberg, wrote an extensive article in Futhark, the same journal that we published in now, where he took this whole thing one step further because Buralf had identified the very first riddle on the stone that had been previously not understood. It deals with two, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Booty, war booties, that had been taken 12 times between two people. Mm -hmm. And previously that was just a legend and no one could give any explanation of that. But Buralf found that this is actually a riddle well known from Anglo-Saxon riddles, the Exeter book. And it deals with how the sun and the moon steal each other's light. Oh, okay, I see. Okay, so there is a sun moon thing. And Pat Holmberg was able to take this solar metaphor one step further. Then he had other ideas about how to read the stone, that you should follow the direction of the sun and so forth. A quite complicated interpretation that personally I didn't put much credence to. But um, he's a very constructive person, and after publishing this first article, he got some money to do further research on the Rökstone, and he assembled a small team around him, the archaeology professor Bo Greslund, who's written a great deal on the climate crisis in the 6th century, mm -hmm. and also the history of religion professor Olof Sundqvist in Stockholm, and then finally myself as a runologist, and the person who has to do the math and you know make sure that everything adds up linguistically and so forth and with the runes. And we worked for two years, meeting almost every month for a day, sitting in Uppsala around a table and just discussing possible interpretations. And from the beginning, I did not believe that we would ever arrive at a better solution than the established one. Mm -hmm. But by small measures, we found our way through this maze of different riddles and could find a consistent interpretation dealing with the sun and the overriding motive is what will happen at the end of the world. Okay. And this, remember the Rök stone is a memorial runestone like almost all other runestones from the Viking age. And it's after this son, uh, Vamodr, and he, his father Varin is the one who commissions or carves the stone himself. And why would he do that? Well, there is a poem, the Eiriksmál, which deals with King Eirikir, who is winning a battle, is doing very well, but he's killed while doing this. And he then comes to Odin and he's very pissed, excuse my French, 
by the fact that you know oh, gosh, i was winning here you know why did, why did you let me die and odin then says well i need all the best warriors for the final battle at Ragnarök, the end of the world against the wolf fenrir and the other dark powers right and this is i think the reason why Vorin carved the stone in the first place he wanted to give meaning to his son's death I presume the son died prematurely, and they use a very particular word. The word fager means doomed to die about the son. But, and that always puzzled me, because if, say, he was suffering from lethal disease, it's not like you run off and carve a runestone because someone is sick. Right. And if he'd been killed in battle or something else, he would not have been called doomed to die. But if you believe that he was, from the very start, called by Odin, to participate in this battle, then he would have been doomed to die. And right. after death, he would still serve a very meaningful purpose. And the stone then deals with the different motives, what will happen uh, at, the, at this last battle and when the end of the world and the new world, because what recurs is the sun is eaten by this wolf, Fenrir. But before she is eaten by the wolf, she gives birth to a daughter which will be the new sun in the afterworld after Ragnarök. Yeah, and since we, the small. Yeah. Also, there's a reference to some tragedy that happened nine generations ago. And that mm -hmm. was always thought to refer then back to um, Theodoric, because that would be 270 years af from the 530s when he ruled to around 800 when the Rurik stone is erected, if we're correct about that. Now, when we remove Theodoric, that needs to refer to something else. And we know for a fact that there was this major climate catastrophe in the 530s. There were a number of volcanoes on the North American continent that had eruptions and spread ashes all over the atmosphere. And in Scandinavia, as much as half of all the people died. Hmm. And we, this is the weak point, I, I would have to admit that. Around 800, there are certain events. There is a partial solar eclipse, and there are some other atmospheric events that we think may have sparked a renewed anxiety. I mean, everybody must have remembered about this terrible ordeal nine generations ago, and they, something happens here, and the sun's death may have sparked a renewed anxiety about perhaps the climate catastrophe is coming back. Just like a lot of people these days believe that Christ will return any moment now. And they see the wars and the you know all these bad things happening here are the signs of his return. So I don't think that it's um, going out of line to think that people could have been having this anxiety back then too. Although of course we cannot prove that this is a fact. We can't prove what people thought, but they do refer to something nine generations ago. So if I may paraphrase uh, you real quick, make sure that that I'm crystal clear on what you're saying. We have nine generations ago a memory that something had happened that was somewhat like the prediction of Ragnarok. Yes. That is recurring now in the 800s. A man loses a very favored son in battle and perhaps wonders if something that had happened nine generations before is about to recur. Yes. Is that about right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now there's a problem here, of course, that and we have ourselves to blame because in our press release we did make a point of this whole climate catastrophe, but a lot of news media have then tried to bring that into the modern world, saying that the Vikings feared, you know. Right. Yeah, and of course, we're not making any such claims. Yeah, I've never seen the Old Norse word for carbon dioxide. Uh, <laughs> no, right. I don't think there is one, actually. <laughs> no, well, that's, but that's, that's why this article, uh, I mean, that's why it, it came to my attention as something that it was worthwhile to make a video about, because I was seeing this very interesting work in the news but getting distorted. Um, you know, you know if, I think people today, they see something like climate crisis, the only thing they can even think of is, is today and not realizing humanity has been through, no doubt, thousands of climate crises, right? Um, and, and sort of unable to think about anything except in the context of today. Um, yeah. Which is not to say that this isn't a fascinating piece of work, but it's not, it's not prophecy. I should point out that until quite recently in most countries, every summer was a potential climate catastrophe because if you just one really bad summer, you know, with one bad harvest, a lot of people will starve. 
Right. So this is a constant, you know, I can even remember when I was a child and the farmers were always, it was either too dry, it was too wet or, you know, sun didn't shine or it shone at the wrong moments. And, and of course, farmers to this day are still worried about that. And if we would have another major eruption, we had one in 1887, was it? The Krakatoa down in Indonesia. And that spread ashes over most of the world. And there were a number, I think there was at least one really bad summer there and, and, and the harvest didn't come out as the way they should. And even today, if we had a really super major eruption, many volcanoes, and we were without summer for three years, I mean, how would our society react? Right, right. There would surely be starvation. There would surely be violence. It would look a lot like Krakow. Yes, it would. Yeah, well, that is, that is well put. Thank you very much for clarifying about that. Um, I do see a couple of comments over here. I don't know if I've seen questions yet. Um, I would like to pose one question um, that occurred to me based on something that I've been asked a lot on Patreon lately um, about the transition from elder to younger food there, because the Ruck runestone is a really fascinating part of that story because it's mostly younger food art but you have that that those is it two or three lines in elder food art yes but it, but it looks like to me that the carver uh, i was looking at designs the other day when i was thinking about this that the carver was just substituting elder food art runes for younger food art and not using it as the elder food art alphabet is that is that, that is it that was absolutely correct but it is amazing enough that they are even using these older runes. We have yeah. single instances of runes being used in, in Viking Age inscriptions of the Elder Futhark. But this is the one time when more than, I think, one or two are used, and they're actually used to spell out a message. But as right. you point out, what they've done is it's just an encryption thing, where right. they said, okay, I have, I have a K. I would want, want to write a K, but I'm going to use a letter or rune from the Elder Futhark to replace that and then they you use the the g room because that's a in the, the viking age of food arc, they would be the same right and so it spells out basically a younger food arc message anyway right. but it's it's one of five systems of encipherment right will you say a little bit about the the encipherment on this stone because that's such an intriguing part of it yeah, um, depending on what order you read them in, if it could be that this Elder Futhark thing would be the first system. And then there are three different systems of position encryption that what you did with the Futhark, you divide it into three um, groups. And you would actually, then when you encrypted, you would move the last, the first group to the last position and vice versa. And then you would note which room you were after by noting the group and the position within the group. So for example, the U would be group number three, position number two. Right. And then you could encode that any way you wanted. And they're doing it in three different ways on the Rex Brunstone by little, you know, dashes or later in, in the medieval towns, they use all kinds of fanciful stuff. They can have a man, man lots of men with beard and they will have right three hairs on one side and two on the other, or there will be a fish with, you know, three fins on the top and two at the bottom or whatever. Right. This, this would then be just one room. And exactly why they go through all this trouble, I don't know. And, um, so there are three different sets of these uh, position type runes, the elder runes. And the final one is a simple substitution cipher by which where you choose not the rune, but the one to the right of it. And mm. that, I think, is well known from, I think it's called the Caesarean cipher or something, is well known from classical sources too. It's not very complicated at all. Instead of writing A, you write B and so forth. Why they right. do that? We like have other, yeah, other inscriptions, later Viking Age inscriptions, they also encrypt stuff, but it's usually at the very end, and it can be like the signature or it can be something that is not necessarily vital information to get the basic memorial formula. It can be some extra stuff that we're, they're upping the ante, making it slightly more difficult to interpret. But it seems to be for it purposes of entertainment or showing off or something. And why would they, they would have to do that on the runestone, which is so difficult to start with? I right. refuse to believe that many people could read it at all. And the ones that could read all of it must have been very rare. Well, and I mean, to me, it seems a little bit like 
what do you get for saying it? I mean, is, is the satisfaction the same as finishing a Sunday crossword, right? I mean, is it, is it something like that? Like, like the, just, just the intellectual feat is itself sort of a reward for the person who can do it? You can just imagine our satisfaction when we thought that we've arrived at a solution to this puzzle. I mean, it was tremendous. And I think that people at the time, contemporary people, but it makes me suspect, although I have no way of proving this, that perhaps the audience isn't primarily people around the Rökstan, but rather it's a message to the gods that, you know, we, yes. And I think, I, and again, I don't have any evidence of this, but I think that this, what we see in the Rök runestone might very well be part of the burial ritual for the dead son, hmm. that they would repeat part of the mythology that we point out is also found in the Eddie poems, especially Vaftrun is more, where they also count stuff, they count the memories or the, the, these things. And I think that they've selected the ones that have a bearing on the situation, this, uh, this, and that's why they jump from the second to the 12th, that they had a sort of stock sure. of memories that they would choose from and this one these ones apply in this particular situation see well and that was that was a very interesting part of your your, your paper was seeing the the sogum mini right we tell a memory yeah um, seeing that as 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 a numbered sequence of uh sort of riddles sort of sort of callbacks to bathroom the small or something related to bathroom the small yeah do you postulate a direct connection to bathroom the small or just to a, to a cognate mythic. Uh, yeah, no, not a direct, because first of all, we only have, of course, the Eddic poems noted down in the 13th century. Right. And this would be uh, almost half a millennium after the Rex Runesome. But I think that, and I don't think that's strange, that they would have this basically same mythology in East and West Scandinavia. But since we had so few sources to the Eddic mythology and so forth, and all of the ones that we have are late Viking from the 11th century, um, I think that why wouldn't they have this earlier and the, the Gotlandic picture stones, they certainly seem to bear scenes from Eddic mythology, sure. although it's always hard to conclusively prove a pictorial representation if there is no text and there sure. isn't. But you have the eight-legged horse and, and other pretty yeah, obvious connections. And some of those are as early as the seventh century, so we're not, it's not inconceivable that Virtually the same mythology would be around Rök around 800 as it is on Iceland in the 9th and 10th century. Makes good sense. I see a question here from uh, Flint Ironstag. With this new evaluation of the Rookstone, are there any other runestones or mentions in text that might be more climate minded than previously considered? Um, of course, I've looked for that and I started by looking for runestones that deal with the sun. Uh, and they're actually one that we don't mention in our, in our article, but as a reward for you, to you for doing this. And of course, we will need to publish some kind of monograph where we explain in detail everything that we have thought about. Not that far, about 60 miles from the Rök Runestone in the same province of Ostjotland, there is another not very well-known runic inscription. It's quite small and it's on the bedrock and it's called the Ingelstad inscription. And it has a very strange message. It says that, um, Salsi carved a son, or he made a son, hmm. S-U-N. And, and then it says, Dagger, or actually it's the old D rune, which it used day, and day of course, Dagger is, is the name in Old Norse, uh, carved this into the, into the bedrock. And, you know, what does this mean? Well, on the same surface, slightly below the inscription, there is a hole, a round hole into the bedrock. And around that hole, there are rays. And it very much looks, and within the rays, there are three dots. And um, an unpublished proposal of this says that what we have here is very obviously a, an eclipse of the sun. Hmm. And when you have this eclipse of the sun, you can see stellar constellations in the corona. I've never seen this myself because we haven't had any eclipses around here in my lifetime, but that's, it's a well-known phenomenon. And this person tried to date the inscription by identifying that particular constellation that you could see in this uh, total eclipse of the sun. Huh. Um, and at the, on this, over, over the, the, the inscription, there is a sword. Hmm. Now these are, these things never occur in any other runic inscriptions. They're totally strange. Uh, and I've been told, these are not things I know, but that swords are common representation for comets. 
Hmm. We're, we're dealing with the early Viking age, that much is obvious, but I still think that this inscription I'm talking about is at least 100, perhaps 150 years later than the Ruxerun stone. But it proves to me that at least people were, the sun, the sun is, you just can't get by that. It has to be a solar eclipse. There is no, no other explanation here. People hmm. were interested in this phenomenon. Of course, I mean, it's, it's I've experienced it myself uh, three years ago. Uh, it is a profoundly weird, thing to live through even when you know it's going to end yeah and if you uh, don't it's got to be really scary right yeah i think the next I, th I think in a year or two there's going to be a total solar eclipse in texas by the way if you want to come uh, i should do that no, no, no. look it up <laughs> I never one myself it's I, there was one in, in wyoming three years ago it was really amazing yeah um see so yeah, i see a question here from john daily if i can pose that to you the older interpretation of the rune is relating to theodoric the great seems like a bit of a stretch to me given the distance involved and his relevance to scandinavia are there a lot of precedents for distant people and events making headlines and early rune carvings no and theodoric especially is, is troublesome because this rick runestone would be the only viking age attestation that he was known in scandinavia hmm. Um, we there do are have Eddie poems that mention him, but that's just, of course written later. Well, there are Eddie poems that mention him, right? Guther and Guther too, for instance, but that is, of course, quite a bit later. Uh, do, the, do they mention Theodoric? I, they mention other Gothic kings, but I can't remember they mentioning him. They that... records in Guther and Arcuda too. Okay, well, then I stand corrected. I forget what I said, that was a mistake. Okay, so well, he, he, Eddie that, poems, so. yeah, um, I need to check that up. Um, but the problem is that we've had two types of interpretation previously to the Rurk Runestone. And the standard interpretation, as I said, from 1958 by Elias Hussein, is basically an interpretation that makes good sense linguistically. Every word is sort of explained, yeah, it can mean that. But there's absolutely no consistent uh, narrative throughout the inscription. And his explanation is that Vorin, the father who carved the stone, is basically trying to show off his knowledge his dead son, who perhaps was the inheritor of this knowledge, now isn't there anymore. But I think it's a pretty poor explanation because, first of all, why wouldn't we know any of these stories from anywhere else except for Theodoric? Sure. And secondly, it's not enough, even though the Rurik Runestone is the longest by far of any runic inscription, it's, you just get smatterings of, of information in there. There's just no way that you can get the full set of mythological knowledge so, okay, he could be boasting and people would be very impressed, but that would both more or less be it. Mm -hmm. And considering the effort that goes into this, I mean, we're talking of something incredible. If you ever get a chance to see that Eric Runestone yourself, people will listen to this, by all means do so. It's worth traveling long distances to. It's, it's, it's huge, it's humongous. It's, it's just incredibly impressive. And it must have taken forever to carve. Oh, for sure. That, it, it does seem like a project of, of um, many spare hours over a year or something like that. Yeah. And I don't believe in the explanation just doesn't, it isn't sufficient to me, at least. It's not credible. Uh, there, there have been explanations that are sort of consistent. They have a narrative that the rest of the tales deal with revenge, that Vaudin is trying to get people to take revenge on his dead son. But again, they don't add up. They don't add up linguistically. They, they refer to things that are just too incredible. Some mm -hmm. people would say that we're certainly stretching it, especially towards the end of our interpretation. This is quite correct. But I think that for the most part, we have a quite credible storyline. And I think that there should be a storyline in such a long text as this one. Mm -hmm. And I think that methodologically, it's, it's an advantage to have a consistent storyline than not having one. Well, and what you've put together is much more consistent than anything else I've ever seen. So um, please, we've accomplished that. Yeah. Uh, Stella here asks, the uh, eschatological, eschatological motifs and sort of placing the dead son in the mythology was interesting to me, in part because Joseph Harris has suggested something similar with Egil and his son at Sonatoric. Are there other runestones or inscriptions where this sort of thing is thought to have occurred? Um, I guess the answer is I, I don't think so. Um, of course, we haven't been looking for that, so perhaps there's stuff there that we missed. 
but the very fact that the direct runestone is just so much longer than almost anything else makes it difficult to believe that you will that we will find any narratives of the same type because most runestones just can barely fit in the basic memorial message so and so died you know the best case scenario there will be a short prayer if it's christian and there will be a signature and there sometimes they'll say you know he died in england or something like that but just that the, the brevity of the texts themselves would preclude interpreting narratives of that type however there are also pictures and we're now starting to look into the pictorial scenes we have on plenty of runestones and and we're perhaps there i think that we were going to find stuff there that would be interesting in this context yes okay well and, and of course i suppose it's always possible that more stones will be discovered although something with as long of a message as the rock is kind of unlikely to have hidden from us that long well you never know in 1987 or six or five or whatever they found the malt runestone in on uh, Jylland in Gotland oh excuse me Denmark and uh, that's also very mysterious stone it may actually mention the sun again as well one interpretation claims that but it's not there hasn't been any standard interpretation of that stone yet it's not nearly mm -hmm. as long as the dark stone but it's from the same time and it looks pretty much you know it has similar type of inscription and i think that now we could perhaps go back to that stone and see if we can find a better interpretation of it there's also the sporlosa stone which is perhaps even a bit earlier than the director of stone it has pictures as well quite a long inscription unfortunately it's quite damaged and that is that's another stone that really needs to be we need to go back and look at that and is far less the one that also has several of the same rune in, in a row and in, in one line Several of this. No, that's not that one. I think you're thinking of, I can't remember which one that is, but there are a number of older Danish stones that could be interesting too. But I, I should point out that between say 725 or 750 and 960 or so, 200 years, there are only a total of 100 runic inscriptions. I'm not talking about runic, runic inscriptions in all, in all of Scandinavia. Right. That's so very meager. Yeah, we're not even talking 5% of the total from the Viking Age from this early. So it's it's not until King um, Harold Bluetooth erects his stone at Yenning. That's what sparks sort of the explosion of rune stones. And mm. almost all of them are erected after 960. True. That's a that's a that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Um let's see. Ulla Mullaverne asks, uh, ride the horse to the gold champion. Any relation to Moibru U877? If there's a mythic or even ritual background with the Rook, then maybe U-877 has other aspects to it than just a memorial. Yes, uh, we're talking about the Möjbro stone, which is about, I guess, 400 years earlier than the Rook Rune stone, so it's pre-Viking. Um, it has a rider, definitely, who has a shield or something, a roundish object holding it, quite primitive picture, has something in his hand, could be a staff or possibly a spear or sword, uh, and he has two canines in front of the horse. In the inscription, it says Fravarada, uh, which is a name, and then Anahai <laughs> Slagenar. And this sequence has been interpreted in many different ways. And the most credible one actually says that, that this person comes from a place uh, called Haha in the vicinity. Uh, it means bay, basically. And he is killed, slain in, in uh, Icelandic. Um, the picture itself could represent, I guess, the person dead, but we don't have any single instance where we can prove that the picture on the runestone refers to the person mentioned on the runestone. I find that interesting. Sure. But sure. so I think I like the suggestion here that this could much rather be some kind of um, mythological picture. Perhaps, I mean, we know of a person who has two canines, right? Odin has two mm -hmm. wolves. Um, usually he is pictured with some kind of ravens or birds. There are no birds on this stone, so that would speak against it. Uh, he has a spear, famous spear. Um, the horse itself doesn't have eight legs, so it, it's speculation. That's why I'm a runologist and not an art historian, because I don't right. do pictures very well. Well, and, I mean, some, some stones really do have very compelling uh, imagery. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head the name of the one 
from somewhere in the mid 1000s from Sweden that has the, all the scenes of Sigurd killing Fafnir. But the inscription is just about someone building a bridge for her dead daughter, I think. Yes. But the picture has nothing to do with it. No. And this is consistent with all the late Viking rune, rune stones that it doesn't seem to have anything to do with the dead person. But many of them obviously have old Norse mythology. The Sigurd ones are easy to identify because you can see him sticking the sword in the dragon and so forth. And there are plenty of other scenes that we haven't quite been able. I'm sort of certain that some of them have Christian interpretations, the late Viking ones. Sure. Uh, but here we're more interested in the old Norse ones. Of course. Yeah, I mean, one thing that people end up um, being surprised by is that if you are just rolling the dice and picking a runic inscription at random, you're much more likely to find something explicitly Christian than explicitly pagan. Yes, you do. There are very few explicitly pagan inscriptions at all, perhaps a dozen or so. Do you think that's a matter of them not surviving, or do you think that they simply weren't being produced? Well, obviously, there weren't very many runic inscriptions before Christianity hit Scandinavia. It's sort of a, a rare cultural thing. You have the runic inscriptions, but it's not until Christian faith comes around and they're looking for something. How do we best um, flaunt our faith? And right. of course, there were no newspapers or television channels. You can't have any commercials and so forth. What is the one public medium there is in the society? Rune stones. Mm -hmm. And sort of by combining that, uh, the runestone memorial custom, very, very rare with this new faith. That is what really makes it take off. Right. And um, sometimes I think runestones in the late Viking age, it's just the fact that they're there and they have the names of the people and they have a Christian cross. That's, that's what you need. It's like a gravestone almost, even though they don't mark graves. Well, like the Ingvar stones, for example, which often say he died in Serkland or wherever. Yeah you know that this person was with Ingvar. This has been really, really great to have an opportunity to hear this straight from you. Uh, will you also uh, tell my Patreon supporters and, and people watching this later on YouTube where they can find uh, more of your work on the Dark Runestone and other runestones? Yeah, I almost everything I've ever published is found on my homepage on Uppsala University. Um, so you just go to my homepage there and you will see the bibliography and most of it is available I would say 95% of it is available digitally through the, the same archive that you find this article. I, I try to make everything available these days because that's all we want as researchers to be read, right? Right. So if, if people offer me to publish something in a commercial book company that don't allow digital publication for free, I'm not interested anymore. I don't need that. I just want to be read. Well, it's very generous of you. Very generous of you to take the time with us today. And uh, on behalf of the community of Patreon supporters assembled here. Let me say thank you and uh, wish you all the best. Thank you so much.